right, come on. You guys glad to be at church today? Yeah, there's no better place to be. I'm so glad to be with you. We're finishing up broke and busted. Come on, it's the last day. We're going to put a bow on our resources, on our finances uh, this month. I do want to remind you, come on, this Wednesday, we're going to be serving Shelby County at the Monster Walk. Listen, people line up at 3 o'clock. They line up early, so we're gonna feed them. We're gonna feed them dinner. We'll give away a thousand hot dogs this week. We'll give away tons of popcorn. Come hang out with us. We're gonna set up a, a spot on the monster walk and just love, no strings attached. I, I I spoke with someone this week and they said, "You mean we saw it last year? Saw you guys do?" They said, "Y'all mean to give? Y'all mean to tell me y'all gonna give away that much food? We're gonna give away that much food. No strings attached. Come on, Shelby County, we love you. We love you. That's what we're gonna do this week. So I'd encourage you to be a part of that. And then next week." We kick off a brand new series called What's in a Name? Talking about the names of God. It's, an, it's going to be awesome. I'm pumped about this series. You know, in Scripture, it's not necessarily a thing or, a, or, a, or an idol, anything that ever got worshipped. All throughout the Bible, you can see where people worshipped the name of God. Matter of fact, New Testament says it this way, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. Come on, the name of God, the names of God in our life are important, right? So we're going to talk about that all month long. We're going to uncover that. It's going to be a lot of fun. I encourage you to bring somebody with you. It's going to be a fun month. Go ahead and pull your notes out. We're going to dive in this morning to the last message of this series titled, The Truth About Money. Psalm 112, verse 5 and 6. Let's Let's read it together on our notes. It says, Good will come to those who are generous and lend freely, <coughs> Excuse me. who conduct their affairs with justice. Surely the righteous will never be shaken. They will be remembered forever. So all month long we've been talking about our resources, and we've talked about it. We've said it's important, it's valuable. The Bible really talks about how we handle our resources more than any other thing. Jesus spoke about it more than heaven and hell combined. There's a reason for that. One is we know that it's a great indicator of our priorities. Show me your bank account, and we can show you what's important to you. Everybody in here, we know that power is important, right? Like Alabama Power gets a good chunk. A roof over our head, that's valuable. Who, who think ah, that's valuable? That's important. So we spend money on what's important to us, what's valuable to us. And Jesus said, "Where your treasure is, there your heart will be." So it's important. It's also universal. You can go anywhere in the world, even in uh, villages in the middle of Ecuador, South America, Africa, who have never maybe even seen an actual dollar bill. They've got some form of currency. Some form of currency, and they use it uh, for to, to gain and get resource and live their lives. It's a universal uh, thing, and that's why Jesus used it so much in his teachings and in his parables. Because we know it cuts deep into our heart, our resources, how we manage them and use them. That's why it's so important. And, and we know all through Scripture, God never wants anything from us. But he absolutely wants everything for us. And for him, for us to get everything he wants for us, it directly relates to how we manage what he gives us. So today we're going to be talking about uh, how that, the last little, we're going to talk about some misconceptions of, uh, of money in the Bible and what that looks like here culturally. And then we're going to talk about the truth. Week one, we talked about how to live a legacy. What does it look like for us to live a legacy life? That word legacy simply means, hey, what am I doing? you ever thought about this maybe? What am I doing that's going to make an impact in the world around me? When I'm gone, man, when I'm, when I'm dead and gone, I'm no longer here. What, what am I going to leave behind? And even, even practically today, what am I leaving behind at my workplace with my kids, with my family? What kind of impact am I making right now that's leaving, that's impacting the world, that's making legacy? And then we talked about week two, how to get out of debt. You know, the Bible never says that debt was a sin, but it teaches over and over again that it is a trap. The borrower is slave to the lender. And so many of us have experienced that in our own lives. We've been strapped and we've been enslaved to debt that we've put ourselves in. And there are biblical principles that teach us how to escape debt and honor God through what we talked about last week, through generosity. How do we live that out? How do we escape debt? The Bible says, like a gazelle escaping from a trap. Run. Like it's not just, don't tiptoe out, run away from it so that we can live a life of generosity. And today we're going to open up our notes and we're going to talk about the lies about it and then the truths about it. So let's pray together and let's dive in and see what God's word has for us. Father, we love you. 
Thank you so much for your goodness, your mercy, your grace. Father, we're thankful for the cross this morning. That through it, God, we receive salvation. Through it, God, that we receive healing in our bodies and our minds. Through the work you did on the cross, Jesus, we have provision. God, we're thankful for the cross. So today, we don't want to come in here and think lightly about it or overlook it. God, we're honored today, God, that we get to be in your presence because of the cross. And God, we just ask today that, God, we worship you. We honor you for who you are in our lives. And God, we just ask that as we open your word, that you would give us fresh revelation of what you're trying to teach us so that we could leave here today. Not saying, I, I marked that off of my list. Well, that's done for the day but so that we can say, man, I met with the presence of God and it impacted me in a significant way so that I can live a life on purpose that honors him. God, we love you. Thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you're taking notes, number one, the lies about money. Number one is, it's mine. It's mine. Come on. It goes, every time I think about that, it, it, it sends me back to Finding Nemo, the, the birds on the, in the show. Mine, 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 mine. Come on, everybody. Does. Mine, mine. That's how we treat money, isn't it? Uh, a couple, number of years ago, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen money on the ground. Like uh, I, I have found significant amount of money on the ground at some point in my life. I've, sometimes it's a quarter or a penny. I never go by and not pick it up. Sometimes it's been, I have found $50 before. Come on. I hit the lottery one day. I found a $100 bill one day on the ground. It was awesome. Awesome, thought my life was changed forever. <laughs> I was young, okay? Um, but then there a couple of years ago, there was this one time I was walking out of Walmart, and there was these college students, high school students, there were some students, and they were playing a prank. And I didn't know they were playing a prank, and I was the sucker that they got. I'm sure I'm on YouTube somewhere. Um, I, I remember walking out, there was a $5 bill laying on the ground, and man, I went after that $5 bill, just like one of those birds. That is mine, and I'm going to get it. And they had it tied to fishing line. And can I tell you, I, I crawled on my knees probably 25 yards before I realized those morons were tricking me. I thought, man, what I look like a fool crawling through because I was going to get that money. And many of us treat resource and money like it's ours. We've been taught and, and we've been all through our life, we've been conditioned to think, I worked for it. I worked hard for it. It's Mine, but David understood it differently in First Chronicles 29. Let's read this together in your notes. He says, Oh, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that you would give us anything and that, that we could give anything to you? Everything. Come on, let's say that together. One, two, three. Everything. Everything we have has come from you. We give you only what you first gave us. We are here only for a moment, visitors and strangers in this land as our ancestors were before us. Our days on earth are like a passing shadow, gone as soon, so soon without a trace. And then he goes on in verse 16, Oh Lord our God, even the material we have gathered to build a temple to honor your holy name comes from you. It all belongs to you. The lie about our money is it's not our money. <laughs> it's not ours. The lie is it's, it's, it's mine. The truth is it's not. It's not mine. I'm reminded of, if you've got kids in here, you'll, you'll relate to this because every, every year on my birthday and at Christmas, my wife takes my children and they go pick out a gift. And they, they wrap it up, and it's an exciting time, especially for my, you know, my eight-year-old. She's a little more knowledgeable about this stuff than my little boy, and she's pumped about it. And, man, I'm excited, and I open it, and I'm like, oh, sweetheart, thank you. How'd you know to get me that gift? And we go through this whole thing. But the truth is, I already knew what I was getting. It had already passed through my budget. I paid for my birthday gift. You know what I'm saying? Like, you've done that. You, like, I was no more richer. As a matter of fact, on my birthday and Christmas, I lose money when I get my birthday present and when I get my Christmas present. Why? Because it was mine before it was theirs. Anything my daughter, they're not old enough. They don't have a re anything that they are ever going to give me. It came from me to begin with, didn't it? And that's how come my kid can never buy me out. <laughs> she can't do anything. To, I, it's mine. It belongs to me. And that's the same reality. It's the same reality. We can't buy out God. You know why? 
Because anything we would ever give back to him was his to begin with. He gave it to us. You say, well, I worked hard for that. He gave you that job. He gave you the ability. He gave you the gift. He gave you the knowledge. Everything that we would earn in this world comes from him. It's not mine. Anything I would ever give to God came from him anyways. Here's what that means. You need to write this down. Every dime that I spend should have the holy connected to it. Here's what that means. When I spend money, I should, it's the old adage, the old WWJD. I should say to myself, what would Jesus do with this? When I spend money, it should be holy. It should be, a, a, it, it's, a, it's, it's an opportunity for me to trust. It's not mine, it belongs to him. So it should always be connected to the holy. God, how do you want me to manage this resource? Number two, another lie is it's the key to happiness. That's what we've all been taught. It's the key to happiness, especially in the Western world. In American cultural Christianity, we're taught early on in life to work hard in school and make good grades. Anybody ever else get in trouble because you made bad grades at school? You get in trouble. You make good grades. Why do you need to make good grades? Because if you make good grades, you'll get into a good college. And you need to go to college and make good grades in college so that you can get a good what? You can get a good job, the J-O-B. You need to work that job, and you need to be faithful to that job, and you need to make a bunch of money so that you can retire early and so that you can go down to the beach, right? Like you can live on an island, and you can retire, and you can pick up shells by yourself the rest of your life and be happy. Be happy. That's happiness, the American dream. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to retire early. I'm going to sell my house. I'm going to buy an RV, and I'm going to travel the world by myself. That's happiness. That's what the world teaches. Only to realize when that happens and you people have done it, they realize I'm not happy. I'm not happy. Jim Carrey said it this way, a famous actor back in the day. He said, I wish that everyone could be like me and attain all of their hopes and dreams and fame and fortune so that they would finally, for once and for all, realize that there's more to life than this. It's not the key to happiness. In sociology, you want to write these down. These are extra. These aren't in your notes. There's been studies done for a lot all throughout history, and all of the people that think socially and through people, they've come up with four things that really lead to happiness in this life. Number one is a strong, immediate family, a strong nucleus. In other words, your, your husband, your wife, you guys are strong. Your kids, you got a good relationship. You're intentionally investing in your family. Number two, meaningful work. Meaningful work means this. I feel like I'm needed on Monday when I wake up and go to work. I feel like I'm adding to. Maybe it's a job that you feel like I don't, I'm not super, it doesn't, it feels kind of mundane, but there's something that you're doing meaningful with the people in your life. You're living out your purpose. You're making a difference. Number three is actual friendships. Community, small group, we would call it here, but not, not Facebook community, not, not social media community, not that person that you went to high school with but you haven't actually spoken to in the last 20 years, but that's your best friend. Actual people that you can touch and feel, you know, like a community that you're doing life with. And number four, faith. Some connection to some type of faith. People that have these in their life almost always are living a happier life. Always are living a more joy-filled life. But it's always, if your family is struggling, your marriage is struggling, your relationship with your kids is struggling, man, you don't feel like your job is meaningful. You feel like your job's at a dead end, and you just believe that lie of the enemy in your life. And then, man, your faith begins to struggle. And all of that stuff, and all of a sudden, you're miserable. You're not happy. People are miserable. They're not happy because those, we have believed the lie that this is the key to happiness when really those are the key to happiness. And you need to, the ironic thing, you need to notice that none of those things are connected with how much money you could accumulate in this world, are they? None of them. But they're all directly to tie, they're all directly tied together with what you would have to invest, what you would have to give. How strong is my family? As strong as you're willing to invest in it. How strong? How strong is my faith? As strong as I'm willing to spend time with the Lord and spend time in prayer and invest in that relationship. How strong is my meaning for? As much as you're willing to invest into it, as much as you're willing to live out your purpose where you are on Monday, you get up and say, God, order my steps according to your word today. God, I'm going to live my life on purpose for you. I'm going to, my work's going to be meaningful this week. All of those things, the key to happiness is not what I give get, but it's what I give. That's what Proverbs says. Let's read it together in your notes. Proverbs 18 and 16, it says a man's what? A man's what? Gifts 
make room for him and brings him before the great. It's not what you can accumulate. It's not what you can get in life. As a matter of fact, you could even go to the wealthiest people on the planet, people who have more money than anything. Did you know it's not their money? It's not what they have that makes them influential. It's, what, it's the potential of what they can give that has made them influential, made them, brought them before the great. It's the gifts that I have that God has blessed me with. It's the intentionality that I put into my kids. It's the time that I choose to spend into them. It's the love that I choose to give them, my spouse, my husband, my wife, my job. It's the resource that I, it's not necessarily even money. It's what I have in my life that I can invest that, that makes room for me. It's not what I can get that brings happiness. It's what I can give. That's a lie. It's, it's the money's not the key to happiness. Number three, you've all heard this. We've all heard it. It's the root of all evil. Come on, anybody ever heard that before? Y'all know who says that? People that ain't got no money. <laughs> People that ain't got no money say that. They go, oh, don't worry about getting all that. It's the root of all evil anyways. No, it's not. Let's read it together. Here's what 1 Timothy 6.10 says. It says, for the, let's say it out loud, for the love of money. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people, craving money, have wandered from the truth, the true faith, and pierced themselves with many sorrows. It's one of the misquoted verses in all of Scripture in the Bible. Money used correctly is actually the catalyst for miracles. Money used correctly, used properly, and properly placed has the potential to change the world. It's not the root of all evil. It's when I, it's when I worship money as my source over God. It's when I begin to think that is what's going to change the world. That's the, that's the happiness that I'm looking for. That's the thing that, needs to, that I need to accumulate, that I need to get more of. That's going to bring happiness in my life. That's what begins to breed evil into my life. That's when people begin to get greedy. And when we begin to, when we begin to see resource, my job, my money, the, my investments, the thing that I would get on my own, when I begin to see that as what's going to sustain me, all of a sudden fear begins to settle in, doesn't it? Because, hey, what if, the, what if the stock market crashes one more time? What if I do lose that job? What if that thing does go south? And then we get scared. We get worried. So we, we find ourselves not being generous, not giving, not living a life of purpose, but living really a life of fear that Bible teaches us that God hasn't given us. But it, that's when evil begins to settle in. It's this, it, begins, it starts with the greed that comes from seeing it as my source instead of God as my source. So I say, Said this, don't crave possession over your purpose. Stop craving possession over your purpose. Pursue, pursue your purpose in Jesus and your provision will always be met. When I begin to pursue my purpose and what God has called me to in this life, all of the sudden this over, uh, this more than enough life that Jesus promised seems to be coming true in my life. You see, Jesus says over and over again, I came to give you life and life to the fullest. That's a principle of God's word from the Old Testament to the New Testament. There's never been a time where God gave to his children that he did not give them more than enough. He's always been more than enough. Unfortunately, human nature says that more than enough means I need to build bigger homes and build, have more storage facilities. Did y'all know that the a storage facility uh, market in America is over like a $500 million business? There are more storage facilities now than ever in the history of the country. There are millions of acres of land for us to buy more stuff and rent more storage facilities and get more combination locks and put our stuff because we don't have room for it in our homes in our homes so we don't have room for that so i'm just gonna store it away for when i build a bigger house and then i'm gonna build a bigger house and i'm gonna put more stuff in it and then i'm gonna overflow there and i need to get more storage facility it's not the root of all evil the love of it is the root of all evil so what's the truth What's the truth of the word? What's the truth about money? Scripture teaches us, if you'll turn over your notes, I want to share those with you today with the rest of the time that we've got together. Number one is it's a great tool. It's an incredible tool. Come on, anybody like tools in here? I love tools. Man, I'm a tool fan. I love some tools, and I really love some power tools. I brought some with me today. I'm going to show you some. I love some power tools. I got a skill saw. Come on, I got a sawzall. Who likes a good sawzall? I'm a demo guy. I like demolition. You know what I'm saying? I love, 
uh, just going in with a good blade and just wreaking havoc. You know what I'm saying? When I was young, when I was younger, my dad, uh, with wisdom, with wisdom, realized that I was stupid. And if he gave me a power saw, I was going to cut my fingers off for somebody. You know what I'm saying? So he gave me the actually you know, old school saw. You ever heard this when you're little? Son, let the saw do the... Don't do it yourself. Let the saw do the work. You ever, you know what that looks like for an eight-year-old? Nothing. It's like one end out the other. You start pushing, and that saw blade bends, and you, it's, it's hard, isn't it, when you start learning. It's impossible to think about letting the saw do the work. But then you get old enough where you think, man, life changes, and then you got some power, and you get to plug that thing in, right? And you got... You get some, whoo, that feels good when you turn that thing on. You know what I'm saying? Like something inside of you begins to just rear up. You understand what Tim the Toolman Taylor starts feeling in that show. That wasn't, that wasn't script. I mean, it just, you just feel it when you turn it on. Every man, when they turn that thing on inside, goes, ooh. Every man, every man does it. Every one of us. Because it feels good, and when you turn that thing on, you can cut some stuff up, can't you? Here's the thing. This is what I would call a precision tool. A precision tool. It means you measure. You ever heard measure twice, cut once? You ever heard it? Because you know why? Because all of us have measured once and messed it whole thing up. You had to go all the way back to Lowe's 37 times because you miscut the wood, right? Lowe's is full of people, not on their first trip. Lowe's is full. Of, you know why Lowe's is so full? Because it's full of people on their sixth trip. Lowe's wouldn't make any money if we, weren't, if we were smarter than we were. They'd be poor. It's that six trip we have to make that they make all their money on us. It's that time I didn't measure. This is a precision tool, but how many of you ever forgot your skill saw at home before? And all you had was a sawzall, or all you had was something like this, and you thought to yourself, ah, that'll work. I ain't gonna, I'm going to waste no time going to get that. I'm a man. I can do it. I'm gonna, I'm, you measure, and then you start cutting that stuff with that sawzall, and your, your whole cut ends up looking like this. And then you're tired because you've already been to Lowe's six times and you said, I'll oh, forget it. It looks good just like it is. I'm just going to leave it like it is. And then, and then, you know, somebody comes in, starts looking, and you just tell everybody, just shut up. I did the best I could. All right? That's every man. That's all of us. Every one of us. All right? Here's what you need to know. Money's a great tool, but it's also a precision tool. It's not something that you can just half-heartedly go in and demo. Many of us have done all kinds of demolition in our lives with our money because we don't realize it's a precision tool. We need to measure. We need to calculate how we use it. We need to honor God with it. It's a tool that he gives us. And here's what I've learned with power tools. They're kind of useless unless they're plugged into the what? The power source. Don't do me any good. You know what I'm saying? Like this, I, you can't let the saws all do the work. <laughs> You can't. You can't do it enough. It's got to be plugged into the power source. Can I tell you, our resources, our money, what God gives us is useless unless we plug it in to the power source of God in our life. We could go all of our lives and say, I've got this. I've got it figured out. I don't need anybody's help. Money is a personal thing. Most people don't like to talk about it. Why? Because we are, we're ashamed of how we handle our resources. I've been there. Man, I don't want somebody to know I was half-hearted with my money and, and, I, and I used a sawzall instead of a skill saw in the, wrong t in the wrong application in the wrong place and I caused all this damage. Most of us don't want to do that. It's a great tool if it's used correctly. If it's used correctly. Money's an incredible tool. In the Bible, we're taught that money has two primary purposes. Number one, you want to write this down. It's not in your notes. Number one is it's to meet the needs of my family. It teaches us that. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 10 through 12 says it this way. Paul's talking. He says, even while we were with you, we gave you this command. Those unwilling to work will not get to eat. Yet we hear that some of you are living idle lives, refusing to work and meddling in other people's businesses. You ever known somebody like that? Like they're not working. You know, if we're not doing something, we're not living out our purpose, that meaningful work God's called us to do in this world. Most of us end up meddling, don't we? Like, you know, meddling in people's business. That's what he says. We command such people and urge them in the name of the Lord Jesus to settle down and work to own their, earn their own living. What's he saying? Support your family. Go to work. Earn some resource. Support your family. It's my responsibility to work hard and earn resources to meet the needs of my family. My kids wake up. I don't know if you guys are like this, but every single day, about every 24 hours, my son wakes up and says, I want some breakfast. Every day. Like there's not a day that goes by that he doesn't wake up hungry. Not, I mean, it's, it, it happens all of the time. Like we all wake up and need, like we need to support the needs 
of our family. Notice it says the needs, not the gluttony of our family, the needs of our family. God always provides more than enough so that the second purpose can be, can be met, and that is to invest in eternity. We are supposed to use our resources to meet our needs and to invest in eternity. That's why every single place you see in Scripture where God gave anything to His children, it was always more than enough. It was always more than they needed. Why? Because he wants to meet our needs and he wants to use us to invest in eternity. He wants to use us to meet the needs of others. And isn't it ironic that both of those principles, both of those things, they're really tied directly together. Proverbs 3 verse 9, you can see it on the screen. It says, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best of everything you produce. Then he will fill your barns with grain, and your vats will overflow with good wine. What is that saying? Give God his. Work for the living. Work for your living. Earn enough to support your family, but honor God with your best, and he will always give you more than enough. He will, it's a principle of God's word. Can I tell you, a lot of people go, well, Brandon, I can barely help myself. I can barely pay the bills for my own family, do the things that my own family needs, much less help other people. We've all been there at some point in my life. But can I tell you the truth about my own life? Can I be transparent with you today? Every single time I found myself in that position, it was because I misused the more than enough that Jesus gave me. Every single time. Every single time, it was a moment that I had to go in repentance to God and say, God, I'm sorry. I wasn't faithful with what you gave me. And if you can trust me again, I'm going to change some things. Those are the moments in my life. God has always given more than enough for me and my family. He's always been faithful. It's never been a time. Now, there have been lots of times where there was more month than there was money. Not because of God's unfaithfulness, but because of my unfaithfulness in doing what God's called me to do with what he's given me. So Pastor Brandon talked to you a couple weeks ago about a tithe challenge. We, we do that around here because we believe in the word of God. So we tell people, listen, just tithe for 90 days. Begin to tithe for 90 days. Give God your best first, and at the end of 90 days, greatest infomercial you'll ever see, if, you, if, if God is not filling you full to overflowing with resources in your life, come tell us, we'll give you your money back. We'll give it all back to you. Why? Because we know that God is true to his promises. If you honor him, he will always give more than enough so that we can invest in eternity. Number two, you need to know this. It's a big responsibility. It's an incredible tool, but it's a huge responsibility. You know why my dad wouldn't let me use a power tool when I was seven years old? Because I would have cut my fingers off. (laughs) It's a big responsibility to get to use a power tool, right? Like, it's a big responsibility. Like, don't cut your hand off. Like, don't do something dumb and not pay attention and cut yourself. Like, it's the same. Money's the same way. It's a responsibility that we've got. What thought have I put into how to use the more than enough that God has supplied for the kingdom. How are you investing your life into the kingdom? Matthew 25 and 29 says this, to those who use well what they are given. You want to underline that because that's been challenging in my own life. That was convicting in my own personal life. For those that use well what they are given, even more will be given. And they will have an abundance. Come on, that principle is so true, and it is found over and over and over again all throughout the Word of God. They'll have an abundance, but from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Come on, if you use well what God gives you, there will always be an abundance. If I can trust you with the little, I'll make you ruler over more. If I can trust you with the little that you have, you'll be, you'll be given responsibility for more things. See, reality is our resources and, and, and how much we get or the lack thereof is directly related to how much God can trust me with. And if he can trust me with a little, if I'm faithful, if I use well what I'm given, the Bible promises that even more will be given. But how many of you have lived this life, and I've been there in my own life, more times than I can count, where you're barely making it, you're barely making ends meet, you're not making good decisions with your resources, and you're not really keeping a budget, and you don't know how much money you're really spending, and and you're barely going to have enough to maybe, maybe pay the power bill or maybe do something, and then the doggone washing machine goes out. 
or the or, or wouldn't you know it, man? The, the engine blows up in my car. Like the, like those are moments. I talk, I've told you guys stories about my engine blowing up when I was in college and I had to ride a motorcycle for six months. Y'all know why? Because I wasn't being faithful with the little, so God took it away, and all I had was a motorcycle to ride in the dead of winter. Y'all know how miserable that is? It's cold. It's cold on a motorcycle in the wintertime if you didn't know that. They don't make heaters on those things. At least the one I got didn't have a heater, okay? So it's being faithful with the little. And if we're not, quite literally, times like that happen in our life. It's a big responsibility. I wrote this question down. What miracle in this world is waiting on my financial obedience? That's a big question, isn't it? What miracle in this world is waiting on my financial obedience? I want to know that I took what I was given and I was faithful to the call of God on my life. I was faithful to the call of God on my life. Number three, you need to know this. It's a poor counterfeit. It's a poor counterfeit. He said, so don't worry about these things. Saying what we will eat, what we will drink, or what we will wear. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows your needs. You want to underline this part, verse 33. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. Here's what I've learned. Money's an incredible tool. It's a big responsibility. But come on, guys, it's a terrible God. It's a terrible God. Scripture teaches over and over again. The Bible says it in Corinthians. He said, Paul says, hey, teach those that are rich in this world to not put so much trust in their money because it is here today and gone tomorrow. Anybody ever experienced that? It's here today. It's gone tomorrow. If we trust that as our source, it will always be fleeting. If we trust that as our God, we'll never find him. To put a bow on this whole thing is this. The single greatest thing you can do in your life is to fully trust in the Father Don't allow the customs of this world to allow your life to be dominated by the stuff in this world. Jesus talks about it in in Matthew chapter 6. He says, listen, don't worry about what you drink or what you're going to wear or what you're going to do. He said, even all of the unbelievers in this world, he said, their minds are dominated by what that's going to look like. But he said, seek first the kingdom and His righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. Can I ask you a question? Let's be honest with ourselves. How often is your mind dominated with how we're going to pay the bills at the end of the month? How I'm going to clothe my kids? How I'm going to put food on the table? How I'm going to pay the light bill? We're dominated. We're in this rat race of life, and our minds and our hearts are dominated with how that's going to happen. Jesus said every unbeliever is dominated with that. He said, don't you understand that God understands every need that you have? So seek first the kingdom, and all of these things will be added. Hey, I want to pray with you. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Our band's going to come. They're going to play some music. want to ask you this morning maybe you've maybe you found yourself in these circumstances believing the lies about what money is not realizing not realizing that living in those lies are what's sucking me from the purpose that God has really for me maybe not understanding the kind of tool resources really are You see, the first church really understood what kind of tool it was because it says in Acts chapter 2, it's in your notes there, it says that they sold everything that they had. They sold everything that they owned. They pulled their resources together so that every person's need was met. What were they doing? They were calculating what needed to be done. They counted it. They understood it. They knew. It was a tool for them to use. It wasn't their source of protection. They said, man, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, whatever whatever needs to happen, we're going to meet some needs. And it says, as a result, the city, people, unbelievers, people looked at them and they said, what they generally, they generally liked everything that they saw. And by the thousands, people were being added to the kingdom. What if today you began to realize, I really, I believe with all of my heart, there are people in this room right now 
who are dominated by your financial situation. And I don't take it lightly because I've been there. You don't have a clue in the world where the next thing's going to come from. How you're going to, how you're going to do all the stuff that has to be done this month. And that's not lightly. And can I tell you, God cares about it. But can I tell you, it all begins with understanding who God is in your life. And you'll never, you'll never, you'll never have money in the proper position in your life until God has His proper place in your life. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. The Bible says that God knew every dumb, stupid decision you and I would ever make. He knew every sin we would commit. He knew every opportunity that we would choose to, to, to trust in our resources, to trust in our own abilities, to trust in our own way. He knew every opportunity that we would take to choose us over him. And he loved us enough anyways to send his son to live a perfect sinless life, to die on a cross so that he could purchase us back. Come on, that's good news today. I want you to know that he loves you more than you could ever imagine. And I'm going to tell you, that resource situation won't ever change until until your source situation changes. So today I'm going to invite you to a relationship with Jesus. On that connect card it says, I'm committing my life to Christ. Maybe you need to recommit your life to Christ. Maybe it's been the first for the first time in a long time. You're in a position where you're understanding through the power of the Holy Spirit that God has to be first. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer in just a moment. And I'm going to tell you, it's not what I say. It's the condition of your heart that matters. And then maybe you're here today and you say, man... I've trusted in Jesus. He's my Savior. I know that for sure. But there have been some times where I've, I have treated my money like a sawzall. And I'm not, uh, man, my budget is not there. I, I'm not, I'm, there's no precision with how I'm using it. But I need to know that I'm trusting God with everything. And I'm going to start living on a budget. I'm going to start all, uh, walking in generosity. I'm going to start living my life on what God's given me to, to invest and not so much what I have to accumulate. I'm no longer going to live in fear. But I'm going to live in trust and power of Jesus Christ in my life. So I'm going to lead you in prayer this morning. Father, we love you. God, we are grateful for your mercy. We're grateful right now for the power of the Holy Spirit that's resting in this room. God, I bind the enemy and every lie he would whisper in someone's ear right now. And God, we ask and declare over your life, over every life in this room, we ask that you would forgive us of our sins. God, we ask that you would make known right now in our life every sin in our life that has separated us from you. And Father, we ask that you would forgive us of those sins. God, we lay it at the foot of the cross and we ask that you would do what your word promises, that you would take it and throw it as far as the east is from the west, never to be brought up again. We're grateful for Jesus and the work he did on the cross. So we accept his salvation and we commit to follow you as our Lord. Jesus, we confess that you are Lord, that you died and rose again, and you came back to life three days later, conquering death, hell, and the grave. And we accept through the power of the Holy Spirit the work of God in my life. So from this day forward, I can say I'm a child of God. Thank you, Father, for salvation. And for my friends today, God, who, who just need, God, to make some decisions. God, we need to start living in precision, not in demolition. Father, I pray that we would begin to make some uh, meaningful decisions in our life, in our family, to get on a budget, to walk that out, to begin to start using well the resources that you've given us so that we can continue and begin to start living in the overflow of life so that we would have enough to meet our needs and to invest in the kingdom. God, use us for your glory. Let us. If you can use anybody in this world, God, use us to make a difference in Shelby County with the gospel of Jesus. We love you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, church. Can you celebrate that today? Come on, don't we serve a good God? Yeah.